I entitled tonight's lecture, Getting Ready for Mashiach, End of Days. Getting Ready for Mashiach, End of Days. I would like to um, show you how this portion of Pinchas is tied to the Mashiach and redemption. You would read the story, you probably wouldn't see the connection, obvious connection, but I would like to do that tonight. Before I do, I want to go back and review some of the sources, some interesting sources, that points us to where we are at in the end of days in preparation for the Mashiach. The birth pains of Mashiach, according to the Chazal, informs us that we will traverse, uh, have a gr great uh, time of change before Mashiach, Mashiach comes. And it is written in uh, Sefer Lama by the Holy Ramak, Ramak. It says in these words, a summary, it says, At the end of exile, close to the time of our redemption, the trouble for Israel will strengthen to... Uh, to to a heavy, just an incredible strength. And it will be trouble for them for, from the great troubles that will sound, uh, surround them from all directions. And the reason why the Shekinah uh, will judge her house, the Jewish people, and bring them to the tradition of the covenant is to purify them towards redemption and toward the good that is promised to us through the prophets. And to measure of what goodness cannot be fathomed by the mind or idea, so much so that the redemption from Egypt will not be remembered. We've heard this one before, right? Before the redemption of Israel in the future. And everyone according to his debt, debt sins, that is sins, will be pained. And anyone who will be stubborn is not, and not repent will lose out. Whereas anyone who lays his neck out with the yoke of repentance and acceptance of the troubles with a smile and gives his shoulder to bear the sufferings will be purified and will merit. Rabbi Yitzhak says the year of King Mashiach will be revealed. He says all the kings of the nations will pro uh, provoke each other. He says the king of Iran or per uh, per Persia will provoke the Arab king, apparently Saudi Arabia. And the Arab king will go to Edom, American uh, supporting Saudi Arabia, to take advice from them. Then the king of Persia will go ahead and destroy the whole world. And all the nations of the world will tremble and be panicky and will fall on their faces. And pains like birth pains will take a hold of them. And it's when, the, when, the, um, when Rab Rabbi Yitzhak said that he will destroy the world, it does not literally mean the whole world will be destroyed, because you and I both know that no one is going to destroy all of creation. Why? Because this is, belongs to him, to Hashem, and Hashem will preserve it and also preserve Israel. So, going on, he says, and Israel will trouble, uh, will be in trouble and be panicky themselves and will say, where will we go from here? Where, what are we going to do? There's no place for us to run. How can we hide? Israel is actually saying those very same words in periodicals, articles all over the internet. Israel says, if Iran is given the, the option for a nuclear bomb, what are we going to do? We are not going to have any other option but to defend ourselves. The uh, Rabbi Yitzhak goes on and says, And he will say to them, My children, do not be afraid. Whatever I made, I only made for your benefit. Why are you afraid? Something that we have to remember for those who are grounded in Torah knowledge is that we don't approach the end of days as a doomsday scenario as some people in some religions do. Rather, we see this as merely the marching steps to the Mashiach. We see this final days as being the days of hope, not a, 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 a days of despair. And so we approach it totally different. So when we talk about getting ready for Mashiach, in the end we're going to use the example of, of Pinchas as the example of how we are to respond when it comes to being ready for the Mashiach. This quote comes from the Geon Advelna, himself. And he says, uh, he actually revealed this before his death, 
uh, shortly before his death. He says, when you hear the Russians have captured the city of Crimea, you should know that the times of the Messiah have started and his steps are being heard. And when you hear that the Russians have reached the city of Constantinople, which is what? Istanbul, Turkey, you should put your Shabbos clothes on and don't take them off because it means the Messiah is about to come any minute. That was not spoken too many hundred years ago, right? Too many years ago. And similarly, we see a great trend, uh, tension between uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, and America. And it is said by Rob Yitzhak again, and I heard that President Obama said that there is no problem asking Iran. I'm sorry, not Rab, Rabbi Yitzhak. He says, and, and the idea is that President Obama said that there was no problem um, attacking Iran. And even though they were trying to make an agreement with Iran, talking about Saudi Arabia and the United States, this will not work for them, and a great war will develop from this, as is brought down in a book called Yakut, Ho'ev, Israel, and it says that in the end of days, the nations of the world will want to fight against each other, but they will think and contemplate that by doing so, it would, befin it would benefit Israel. So they will gather together to iron out their differences between them so they will not need to fight, i.e. deal with Iran. However, this will not help them, and they will end up fighting each other until they reach the end. It is interesting that the United States has hopped, skipped, and jumped around Persia, Iran, since the beginning of the first Gulf War. They continue to do it because no one wants to deal with Iran. And at the same time, they're figuring, and up to this point, well, Israel will deal with Iran. But what seems to be pointed to by many of the sages of Judaism is that in the end of days, what's going to happen is there's going to be a shift. And the shift will be, well, maybe the whole problem is Israel anyway. And if we didn't have Israel to deal with, all of this would go away. We wouldn't have Iran wanting to destroy Israel because Israel is, is, is dealt with appropriately. Well, let's go on. It is concluded that it is permissible to say in this matter that, th that 500 years ago when this last text was written, talking about in the days the nations will fight against each other, it is also written that all nations will gather and make plans of peace, a deal with Iran, for example, between them, and they will turn to Israel to destroy because they establish for themselves a government that is a state of Israel, and a time of trouble will come to Jacob, but it will not come to a crisis, but rather from it he will be saved. What, it, what does it mean he will be saved? Talking Israel is going to be saved. We don't have to worry about what's going to happen to Israel. Many things are going to happen that is going to be the trouble of Jacob's trouble. As a matter of fact, someone mentioned, was it in last class, that someone asked a question about Jacob's trouble? It wasn't on camera. And the idea of Jacob's trouble is not trouble because of it's Israel's trouble. Israel's going to have its trouble. But the real trouble is going to be in the nations. The nations are going to be shaken at the foundation. And now whoever's not attached by Torah is going to fall apart. Do you remember... Um, Last year, I think it was last year, all over the world, they would hear these strange sounds being made like, like a shofar. Here's an interesting that comes from Meshchet uh, Megillah 17b. It says, why did Hazal, the, the Hazal, say, I see fit to say blessing of redemption as the seventh blessing of the Amidah. Uh, the Rabbah says, it is because they will be redeemed in the seventh year in the future. That is why they established it in the seventh blessing. The Gemara asked, Did the, didn't the Master say in the sixth year sounds, quote, sounds will happen, and in the seventh year wars in the year after the seventh? Ben David comes. There's a question. Is it when Ben David comes? So how could it be said that we are redeemed in the seventh when we are, we are redeemed in the year of the seventh? The Gemara answers that the war is the beginning of the redemption. 
At first glass, how could the Gemara say that the war is the beginning of redemption, when war generally means what? Destruction. Rather, we must say that when we see that there is a great war in the Shemitah year, what is the Shemitah year? When is the Shemitah year? This year. We have just a few months away before the Shemitah year will be over with, correct? He says, we will know that we're being redeemed, and then inside we will feel something similar to a personal general redemption, and the beginning of the joy of redemption will begin to blossom. Wow. <laughs> so when war begins to rumble, when you see the bombs begin to fall, and you see Israel even more threatened, you need to be dancing a jig. You need to be jumping up and down because redemption has taken place. But I want to talk about at the end of this, how do we make this a personal and general redemption, which is very important. It is also brought down in Mishchet Sanhedrin 97a. It says that in the sixth year there will be sounds and in the seventh year there will be wars. And Rashi there explains that when it says there will be sounds in the sixth year, in his second explanation, he says, sounds of the shofar blowing as it says that a great horn shall be blown. And it's known, publicized, that during 5774, which is the sixth year of the Shemitah cycle in the world that scientists have tried to figure out and research scientists have not been able to prove where are these sounds coming from. Some said maybe it's because the shifting of the earth poles. Maybe it's the shifting of tectonic plates. But nevertheless, if you've gone to YouTube and listened to the sounds, it's, uh, it's quite strange. And it's very hard to replicate something like that. It is an amazing thing. The Chazal, it is also written uh, in the holy books. Um, okay, yeah. yeah when, when you consider what the Chazal wrote and you calculate it, we're actually right now at that moment. It's very possible that this generation could see Mashiach. Now, we have to relate something that's uh, an interesting quote that comes from the sages of blessed memory that says that each generation that the temple is not built is what? Do you remember this quote? Is responsible for the destruction of the temple. Which means that this generation that could potentially see Mashiach can be now responsible for building the temple by making redemption personal, by making it real to yourself and important to yourself. Numbers 25, 11 through 13, it says, Pinchas turned my wrath away from my children of Israel when he zealously avenged me among them. Therefore say, behold, I am him, my covenant of peace, and it shall be for him and his offspring after him a covenant of eternal priesthood. Pinchas courageously took up God's cause among the Israelites. Others, too, witnessed Zimri's offense and provocation, including Moshe and the sons of Aaron and the elders. Pinchas himself was the junior ranking officer, the youngest guy. Yet he was the only one to act thus bringing salvation to the Jewish people and to obtaining a great reward for himself. This teaches us a very important lesson. Sometimes leaders remain silent in the face of certain events. This does not mean that nothing is going to be done. Conversely, nor does it mean that this silence may be used as an excuse to ignore an event. On the contrary, when aware that you can do something about it, you are obligated to do something about it. The fact that those greater than you say nothing and remain passive may very well be because the incident has special bearing upon you. You are dealing with something that you are to correct or to refine or perfect, to achieve on your personal perfection, your purpose in this world. As I speak these words, I'm reminded of how I felt uh, a few, just a few years ago when making the decision to, to leave where I was at in my religious worldview and to go to, toward Judaism, and to suddenly be, find myself thrust into teaching Torah to non-Jews, as well as some secular Jews and 
people coming to Judaism. I felt that's not my, that's not my position. It's not my, uh, my responsibility. I'm not, I'm not a Rav. I, what, am I, what am I doing? That's not my job. There are plenty of great Chachams in Torah that should be doing this, not me. I should be the one sitting back learning and studying, not being the one that speaks. And yet, I look around me, and the proverbial Moshe's and Aaron's are being silent. The Jewish world is busy trying to save the Jewish world, not trying to save the non-Jewish world, the nations. And I found myself being responsible, and it's like I, I picked up the spirit with total risk to my own life, realizing that I will open myself up to complete ridicule. So did Penchas when he found himself back. The people didn't, uh, didn't uh, praise him to be the next hero of, of Israeli uh, life. Instead, what did they do? They pointed their fingers and accused him of being some horrible murderer, just a guy that just randomly went out and murdered somebody out of a crime of passion. The sages of blessed memory say that Pinchas was identical with the prophet of who? Did we say this last time? Elijah. Elijah. This expression is rather odd because Pinchas preceded Elijah, as we learned, and should not then say Elijah is Pinchas. According to the Zohar, however, Elijah did perceive Pinchas, I'll bet, as an angel and not as a human being. This has the following implication. As stated in the above, no one should pay attention to what others do or fail to do. If an opportunity arises to accomplish something, one must go ahead and do it. When wondering where will I find the strength to do so, the answer is in Pinchas, is Elijah. This is when the Almighty places you into a situation that requires self-sacrifice, you are also given the necessity and the abilities to carry out the task. He gives strength to those he calls for the task. I'm thinking of, of um, Gideon, who is in a hidden place of the field where he could thrash the wheat and get it prepared. They were hiding from the enemy. Because they didn't want to be out in the open because they knew what would happen. The enemy would come and raid their food storages and that would be it. And then the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, You mighty man of valor. And Gideon was like, Are you talking to me? Right? You can't be talking to me. I'm hiding from the enemy. Why would I be a mighty man of valor? It's never been tested. The angel was calling that because the angel knew that if Hashem had given him this mission, he must be a mighty man of valor. Each one of you have the opportunity to be a mighty person of spiritual valor. And what you have to do is be prepared to hear the voice of Hashem that calls out through the Torah to call you to do the next thing. Now, I'm not talking about picking up a sword and starting a militia or an army group. I'm not talking about that. Uh, yeah, far be it from any of us in this room to do that. However, Torah does sometimes say that this thing needs to be taken care of in your life. It's a very personal thing, and yet we ignore the realities that it needs to be done, i.e. there's a certain level of observance that you need to commit to. There's something that you haven't taken care of in your personal character, your midot. There's something that you know needs to be refined, and yet you don't feel that you have the strength to do it. And Torah is calling out and screaming to you, saying, you mighty person or human or woman or man of valor, it's time to do it. It's all right to test and see, but know that if God is asking you to do this in this hour, you could be the simple one person key to the piece of redemption's puzzle that needs to be put together. One is not to think in terms of this one or that one can do the job, meaning, well, I know somebody else can do a better job than this. I know I've done that. I do it all the time. You've heard me say that, right? Oh, there's a dozen people right now that could do this job. Let's find them. But we can't find them, so we're stuck here. The fact is that everything coming our way relates to and belongs to our mission. Everything. Everything's by the hand of Hashem, right? 
That means that we have the abilities to deal with it, and we must do so with self-sacrifice. And where there is a sincere will, there will be a miraculous way. One will surely succeed. We must follow the example of Pinchas. Thus, we will transform this world, this world, as the Ramchal says, that it is the duty of man to examine the presence of God in this world and then eke out of it the Shekinah of God and bring down to it. It is your duty to do it in your world. We can't change the world out there, but I can change this world, my world. And that's what it's talking about. So we follow the example. We transform the world into a fitting abode for the sanctuary of God and godliness. Consequently, we see with our own very eyes that Pinchas is Elijah, the precursor of the messianic redemption. As it is said, as it is said I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the coming and great awesome day of the Lord. Malachi 3.23 and it says, The harbinger who will proclaim peace, the harbinger of good, will proclaim salvation to Zion. Your God reigns. Isaiah 52 verse 7. So as we watch the armies march across borders that are no longer defined, as we see evil seemingly grow without any level of discouragement, the destruction of good people in the world, people being het beheaded, burned at the stake, crucified, it seems that the old Persian Empire is on the rise. But I want you and I to know, and those who will be watching this video, that that is a short-lived event. It's not going to last long, okay? So we don't need to be worried. I want you to know that as we see the end of days coming, know that redemption comes at the hand of Mashiach. Know that Mashiach will come when we as people of the nations and the Jewish people gather around one God and one Torah and begin to live a life of righteous people. We can turn this world around. If you want to see uh, ISIS defeated in a single day, if you want to see the war of Gog and Magog end in one day, then we of the nations need to begin to proclaim that one God and that salvation only comes through the Jew. And when we do that, we will see the world change. So that concludes the lecture.